This is S4 with your host, Eric Cooper. Folks, and welcome to S4, where we talk about the real issues involving paranormal and current events coming to you live from the S4 headquarters in the heart of the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. We also cover topics such as disaster and terrorist response and preparation and veterans issues as appropriate. So, tonight, it's the 9th of February. It's been a crazy winter of rain and snow, but tonight it's actually clear. And it's going to freeze at 28 degrees. Yay! So tonight we're talking with Francie Miller, our resident psych therapist, about psychiatric issues and the paranormal. Do fears and phobias draw in entities, or do paranormal events cause psychiatric issues? And how do you differentiate between the two? So Francie's been in the psych field for the last 30 plus years and has a good grasp of what is a psych issue and what could be paranormal. More psych professionals need to be involved when it comes to paranormal investigation and assessment. Tonight with us, we have Cole and Kay- Kayla Wigleitner, Francie Bullock-Miller, our psych therapist, and Eric Markham, our S4 scientist, will be joining us later on in the show. So how are we all doing tonight? Perfect. Good. Good. Can, I, can I say something quick? Of course. So the reason that we decided on this topic is because I was looking through Facebook last week, and I saw something that I probably laughed for about an hour and a half. And I was alone, which was a good thing. <laughs> that makes Because I crazy. couldn't stop. There is a phobia out there that is the fear of somewhere, somehow, there is a duck watching you. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that one, uh, Francie? No. <laughs> <laughs> that is so entertaining. <laughs> I want to meet someone with that phobia. I wouldn't. And all watch I, Donald Duck videos with them. You know, you know, all I could think of when you said that is the Aflac duck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Aflac. That commercial has to be horrible for them. <laughs> right? A duck just sneaking up like, on you, handing you money. More like Aflac. Ah! <laughs> yeah. <sighs> so, yeah, you just. I'm baffled. Um. It reminds, it reminds me of arach- arachnophobia. You can feel the duck watching you, can't you? I can. <laughs> Better than an alien. But, yeah. So, you know, running the team for, oh God, let's see, eight years, seven years, I've got to say we only had one incident until we met you, Francie, of yeah. any kind of psychiatrist or anyone in the psych field that approached us and said they didn't think what their clients were experiencing was psychiatric but was actually paranormal. And when I got that phone call, I was actually, uh, I think, dumbfounded for about 30 seconds because you don't see that. Uh, Because because the people are not in tune with paranormal. But why is that? Um, and I'm jumping ahead because it's actually one of my questions for you later on the show but it, it kind of goes to my first question anyway of 
What makes you <coughs> different? You've been in the psych field for 30 plus years. When did you first have your paranormal experience? And is that what made the difference? Honestly, I had paranormal experiences before I really started practicing. So that may have been part of it, but for me, I was intrigued with the people that I saw in the locked unit of the ho- of the hospitals that oh, I worked and that's in. That's another question I've got for you. But go yeah. ahead. <laughs> so um, those folks looked like they were having, like they were possessed, honestly. Um, and it, it, I was intrigued by that. And then... I started researching, and you know, I'm. I didn't. I, I think what keeps people from really diving into it, and there are doctors now, psychiatrists now, that are more open to this. But I think what keeps people from that is peer pressure. You know, they don't want to be laughed at. They they don't want their reputations affected. It's uh, psychiatry is a really tough field. <laughs> it's it's kind of a I mean it, it, the rest of medicine it's on the fringes of of the rest of medicine. You know you can you can measure um, other illnesses like diabetes. You you see this it's it's more of a physical thing that you can see and you can measure in their tests and psychiatry is not like that it's it's way more subjective and i think that i think that's part of it and then i think that you know people don't want to be laughed at they don't want to you know take a lot of flack from their from their colleagues but there are people that there are psychiatrists and psychologists that are interested in it but i think what you find is you get more interested when you retire <laughs> Because there, you you don't have the pressure, right? The well, peer I mean, pressure. If you think about how many years it took for people to accept psychology as an actual medicine oh. in the first place, yeah, it used to be thought of like most people think of paranormal now. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's just insane! Yeah. It, do, it doesn't happen. You can't have a mental illness. What is mental illness? You know. So yeah, I think that evolving through the years will probably have a lot more people that are willing to look into that. It, it just seems like it's a slow process with as, as long as we, we've seen paranormal television shows for the, at least the last 10 years. That yes. I would think it's becoming more mainstream recognized or, yeah, recognized. That uh, I think ha- that's part of it, you know, but still, I mean, when you think about our culture here in America, we we have uh, we still have a lot of um, uh, you know we don't like psych. We we are careful to stay away from it, you know, and and treat it as at arm's length. There's a lot of of you know just feelings against it well you know i i think it's that people are scared of what they don't understand Mm -hmm. and the problem is is that like you were saying with diabetes or something like that it's curable they understand the reasoning behind it we don't Mm -hmm. understand the human mind and i think that that in itself is already scary for a lot of people that think scientifically (laughs) and then adding a paranormal element on top of it is just too much for a lot of people yeah, but I, I'll tell you, I think um, it, there's a lot of a lot more research being done into consciousness, and you know what that means. And there's it kind of ties into physics, quantum physics. Um, you know the I don't know if you guys have seen the the movie. It's been it was like 2005, I think. The what the bleep. Do we know movie? Did you guys have any of you seen that? I don't think I've seen that one. 
Oh, it's so good. What the bleep it's do you very know? Very good. What the bleep do we know? Yeah. Um, it it ta- it it looks at, um, and I'm not a physicist by any means, but you know, it it looks at the quantum level of of uh, when when things are possibilities, right? Until you focus in on them. And then it becomes like real. It becomes a part of your your reality. And I think that with that 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 gives a lot more credibility to you know intention work. And when we focus on like we've dealt with clients that have that want to get rid of the supernatural in their lives, but they think about it all the time and they look for it all the time. And, and you know, with their intention, they're, like, making it more real. They're pulling it right? back in. Yeah. Um, and so a, a lot of the things that we've done is teaching them to, if they want to get rid of it, to stop that. Um. And, you know, I think it, the, the other thing that I think uh, that we're, we're figuring out is people that have had paranormal experiences are more likely to have other paranormal experiences because your mind is open to it, right? Mm-hmm. And people that have had trauma in their lives are more likely to experience paranormal in after after the trauma because the trauma and kind of opens people up to other realities for example like a, a your brain can process check this out 400 billion bits of information a second but we're only aware consciously aware of 2,000 bits of information per second. So the rest of it is subconscious. The rest of it is subconscious. Um, it, it's possible then for our eyes to see more than what our brain can comprehend. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, I think that that, and then when you take somebody that has had an experience and they're more open to it, they're going to be more open to seeing something afterward. But, okay. you know, we tend to not, we just, we tend to see and then only believe what we see. And then we only believe that, that things are possible if we see them. But there's all this other information that our brains are taking in that we're not getting consciously. When do you think it's going to be that the psychiatric fields get more uh, accepted? I guess, yeah, accepted is the word. Um, what I see, coming from the military side, if you go and you're seen by a therapist or anyone in the psych field, you're all of a sudden you're ostracized and you're seen as a weak because soldiers don't go Stigma. see a, a, a psychiatrist. Um, right. So you, you've got that aspect of it. I think the other aspect uh, is, oh my God, if I if, if they see uh, PTSD or any other psychiatric condition, they're going to take my guns away. Um, those yeah. are the two issues I hear. Yeah, I I think it's a cultural thing, um, and you know I think the paranormal shows and and the teams that we have everywhere mm-hmm. help will help but we we've, we've got a cultural stigma <laughs> against psych and people get punished for for having and that i mean i think that's been the way it's been forever well uh, i i think that's more of an american thing uh, do you do you really i i do 
because you know I've said on the show before. You, you go to when, when I was stationed in Germany and had had uh, a knife thrown across the kitchen, and went to German, the Germans that ran our housing, and they asked, "Why do you have to move?" And I, I told them, "Well, we it, it, it's going to sound crazy, but we have a a ghost in our house." And that woman looked and said, "Oh my God, do you have you have a geist?" Oh, you move down. You don't go back home. Uh, you know, I think you're right. It's a cultural thing. Um, now, had I gone to a German psychiatrist, I don't know what, what, what it would have been, but going by the German culture in general, they believe in UFOs. They believe in alien abduction. They believe in, in spirits and in ghosts and hauntings. There's no question. They don't second guess it. So interesting. Uh, I don't know uh, what's your take, Cole, on on the Canadian side. Would it be the same as American? You laughed at? Yeah, yeah, it honestly would. Um, <laughs> and, like everyone has their own level of belief, and between the two countries, we're pretty much the same on all of it. Yeah, like, um, it's pretty much Western civilization there. Um, depend depending on mainly your religious beliefs. Um, we have a huge population of um, I don't know what you call it, like Hutterites. Um, they're a colonized people who live in small colonies in the area. They're uh, prairie farmers. They would be and kind of like our Quakers. Okay. Yeah. okay. And they, uh, <clears throat> they are a religious-based, religion-based uh, colony. They don't allow that kind of belief. Hmm. Huh. Okay. So you're not laughed at. You're beaten. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um... But then, like, conversely, you've got First Nations folks who have spiritual beliefs and and are more open, maybe? The older generations, yes. Because Cole's also First Nation, so he can speak a little bit on that. A lot of the younger <laughs> generations now, um, it's a big issue that we're actually forgetting our history because... The ones that live on the reservations, they just want off them and they have no... Is it not taught? Oh, it is, but only to the reservation. They're not allowed to talk to outsiders. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like myself, I'm considered an outsider. I never grew up on a reservation, therefore I'm second class native, is the way Mm -hmm. I put it. So I don't get to learn the same things that they do. Mm Mm-hmm. So... Now, going to the Middle East perspective, the Quran teaches about the jinn, and it teaches about the fairy, and teaches about, you know, now I never really got into the discussion with any of the, the Iraqis or the Somalis when it came to talking about paranormal. So I don't know how that is perceived, but it's taught. So their concept isn't so much demons, the jinn takes that place. Mm-hmm. But the jinn are far worse than uh, the Christian perception of a demon any, any day of the week. Well, so you do you think it, most, it... Go ahead. When you look at most religious books, I mean, pretty much every religious book I've ever read has some form of what we would assume is paranormal in it. Uh, you take a look at the Bible, and we have resurrection in the Bible. They have holy spirits, uh, giants, all these different things that would be considered now paranormal or in the paranormal field. So, uh, I think yeah. it changed with the Puritans. Yeah, potentially. <laughs> They kind of took out the paranormal from the Bible there. <laughs> <But>. mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, 
So, as a therapist, do you see paranormal and psychiatric issues as different or parallel? I think they're parallel. I, I think they're parallel. I mean, I can't speak because right, I right. see things differently, but I, I think they're parallel, and I think that you really have to make an assessment about what you're dealing with. Um, and I think that the go-to is, you know, medication and, and that sort of thing. And, and I've seen that work up to a point, and then you know that it's you, you're dealing with something else as well. Mm-hmm. Um, well, wouldn't that be intention, too? Because, like, for instance, mm-hmm. there are certain rocks, if you put your intentions into that rock, that it is going to protect you, it will protect you, because your intentions are put into it. Yeah. So, if a person puts their intentions into a medication, saying, this is going to make this go away, this is going to make this go away, and they believe enough that it is going to make it go away, wouldn't it then make it go away? Kind of like a placebo. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, you know, then you've got the reality of these medications really mess with your mind, too. Oh, for sure. There, there are certain, certainly side effects, um, and sometimes it makes it worse, uh, you know. But, but I think that, that most, most psychiatrists just rely on the medicine, and then miss the other parts of it. Don't you think that's a bad for the client? It is. It doesn't. It's not. It's not holistic. It doesn't treat the whole person, the whole situation. But you know, I see. I've seen that so many times in hospitals. You'll have a psychiatrist, and they'll, you know, the per. I didn't realize this until I started doing home-based care. But in the in the hospital, the, the psychiatrist will go, you know, here's the medicine, go home, um, you know, take a walk every day. And they have no idea what the person's living situation is like. Maybe they live in an apartment with, you know, 12 other people and they don't have any privacy and... Or they, if they live in a place with a dirt floor, you know, there's just so many assumptions that are made that don't fit into the person's whole life. That's why I've, I really enjoyed when I started doing home-based care. It was so much better because you got to see the person in their element. Mm-hmm. And you got to really fine-tune things and you know that's wonderful if you can get the person's you know their view on life and their view on spirituality and you can you can really make a whole lot of of like better treatment outcomes by looking at the whole person and that doesn't happen often it doesn't happen in our system wouldn't adding a paranormal part to your psychology also scare a lot of the clients, too? Like, I mean, <laughs> if you tell somebody that they're bipolar, there's a pill you can take and you're going to be fine, you know? But if you tell somebody that... You've got a demon. You, you have a demon yes, going with you or you <laughs> yeah. have something of this nature, I, it, that's so unknown for most people that... It would be, yeah. It would be terrifying. It would be, but you know, somebody that's worth their salt is is going to take the person where they find them. You take your you take your your patient where they are, and you don't add in something that's going to scare them or that isn't going to fit. Oh, you do an on. assessment. <laughs> Plus, uh, so a university in India <laughs> did. Uh, um, survey of their patients and they found that over 85 percent of patients in mental institutions in india uh already have paranormal beliefs yeah 
So the, in that, if you know that, then that's what you fold in. But if you're talking to somebody that, well, is a fundamentalist, you know, from a fundamentalist Christian background, you'd be more careful maybe. It's not one size fits all. It shouldn't ever be one size fits all. Hey, and that leads to my next question, because, you you know, it, it's one thing to talk about a spirit and, you know, things moving around the home. It's another to say I saw Bigfoot and I was chased by Bigfoot or I've been having alien dreams and I think I'm being in, being taken by aliens. I mean, you, you mm-hmm. know, it, it depends on what your parameters of the paranormal are. So that goes to my next question of how do you pers- how do you personally, you yourself, define paranormal? coming from a psych perspective. And, uh, How I know do it's I probably, define? I know it's probably different now than what it was two or three years ago when you joined the, uh, joined the initial team. <laughs> yeah, I've learned a few things. <laughs> 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 Definitely. Um, when, you know, when, I you, think when it, you first came to the team, I don't believe you had had too many alien encounters, had you? No. <laughs> None. No. That was before they, like stalked around my house outside. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh. That freaked me out big time. <laughs> so so what's your personal uh, definition of what paranormal constitutes? I think it's, it's anything. I, honestly, it's like UFO. It's like it, things that we don't know what they are. That, that don't fit into a paradigm that we are comfortable with. I think, I mean, it's a broad category to me. Mm-hmm. So, would you constitute cryptids and hauntings oh. all, all, all the same umbrella? Yes. And I, and I, before I started working with you guys, I don't think I would have. I didn't really believe in cryptids and in aliens. Living before. in Idaho? <laughs> well, this isn't the only place I've lived. But to no, me, but, aren't cryptids, Eric. Huh? No, but you've got Bigfoot in Idaho. I know. I've smelled one. <laughs> no, huh? Not anymore. Didn't you see on FMP the group? What? They found his head. Yeah, it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I deleted that post because... Why? You can see the stuffing coming out of the bottom. That was hilarious. No. Is that the frozen one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's been not, going around for years. No, that's... Yes. <laughs> it's a teddy bear that they sell. Oh, of course we try, we try to keep... We try, come on now. We try to keep valid news and FMP. That... No. <laughs> I mean, we're not you. the Inquirer. No. <laughs> I should take down some of my posts then. <laughs> I, 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 I can think some others. I won't say them by name of paranormal inquirers. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh. So I wouldn't consider him paranormal anymore. Truth. <sighs> what the Hobbit? No, Zach Baggins. Oh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's not in the paranormal field to me anymore. Oh. He oh. has changed fields. Oh, what's he in now? Well, he's buying up every piece of uh, serial killer memorabilia that he can. Oh, good God. Really? <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of where he's going now. Is like He owns... He bought uh, Charles Manson's hospital gown from when he died. And his toe tag. I'm not right, even going to ask. As long as he doesn't start, you know, <laughs> killing brown-haired, green-eyed women, I'm good. <laughs> uh, I just can't believe the guy in the morgue was able to sell that legally. Uh, he probably shouldn't have. Oh, his toe tag. Wow. Just... just I know. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Scratch him off a list of who to have on. Yeah. No, uh, anyway. <laughs> so, what... So, we're, we're jumping here. What are some of the specific conditions that you see as enhancing the paranormal or drawing it in? Uh, is there any specific psychiatric conditions that you can see... I don't know, example, schizophrenia. Do you see autistic yeah. children? 
as maybe being more prone to paranormal? There, 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 is there anything specific you could see as being more paranormal prone? Trauma. 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 More so childhood trauma or more so just trauma it, in general? Either. That makes because sense. what happens, it, it opens you up to... It, you know, there, there's something that happens when you're when you're traumatized. Um, it 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 rewires your brain. Well, and you know, it trauma. Makes, I could see this because because trauma causes intense fear at certain points, yep. and there is a lot of entities and a lot of things that feed on intense fear. So I could mm-hmm. see that bringing in a lot more paranormal events in somebody's life. Mhm. And it, I mean it it also just kind of opens a door. Um because it when you when you when you're dealing with PTSD, you have your brain changes. It physically changes and the way that you see things change and you do it it, it you have a fear and that's an open doorway. I, I I think trauma is a huge part. And after somebody experiences that, they tend to see the world differently. Like their world view changes. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Right? <laughs> Am I right? <coughs> yeah, I hate Definitely. the world. Definitely. Do you think that happens every time? I think it depends no. on how fresh. Would you agree? It, it depends on how fresh the trauma is. That the as the years go on, it turns the same. Essentially, it's the same anger. It's the same hatred. It's the same the same rage. Um, yeah, but I had that all before the accident. <laughs> I was an asshole before the accident. Okay. And I'm an asshole now. <laughs> Nothing's changed. <laughs> yeah. No. No. I think it. it, it I think it changes, but I also think that who the person was, what their coping mechanisms were before, have a big difference, you know, make a big difference. I also believe that it's the type of trauma. A person can go through some form of childhood trauma, and that can stick with them for, well, it does, forever. Yeah. Uh, you can also have trauma on top of that childhood trauma that causes different thought processes than it did when you were a child because of the fact that you have a different mind at that point. So I I think that you can be multiply dramatized in very different ways and it can rewire your brain in very different ways each time depending on the type of trauma and when it happens in your age. So let me, let me, so my PTSD stemmed from Somalia. Then I yeah. went to Iraq twice. The, the the second time, there wasn't a whole lot of traumatic events. But the first tour in Iraq, we were mortared every day. Mm-hmm. So that would be seen as a different kind of trauma. Um, yeah. But I guess a, a question with that, do you see multiple traumas is the, the more traumatic events you have, Making they build more on exposed, one another. Ma- say, say again? They build on one another. Right, but does that make you more susceptible to paranormal versus the one traumatic event? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. Cause... Because it, well, and you know, like we've talked about um, eye movement desensitization. That works really well if you've got a single trauma, like, (laughs) you know, if you've been in a car accident or, or, you know, whatever, you, you watched your significant other die or, you know, there was single trauma. But when you've got trauma after trauma after trauma, some of this stuff doesn't work. No, you're talking about ENDR? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was told uh, by my therapist, oh God, back in 07, 08, that EMDR wouldn't even be a, an option. Um, yeah. 
he, he he tried putting me through prolonged exposure therapy, and uh, that didn't. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. But so. But thinking of this from a military point of view, from what I know from documentaries and that type of thing, boot camp in itself is traumatic. Honestly. You don't feel like it after, maybe, because you made it through that, but it really is a traumatic experience. It is. Uh, it's even more traumatic if you don't, you know, if you don't, if you march with two left feet and get grabbed by the throat by a drill sergeant. That you, <laughs> if you do everything perfect, uh, then you just go through unscathed and okay. But so what boot camps are designed for is to break you down. They intentionally break you down and they build you back up as a... As so you a, can handle the traumas of actual war, but, like, even going through that itself can be traumatizing and it starts it you out on that path. That All boot camp does is trains you to kill and be tactical while you're doing it. But at a human Detachment. nature level, that is trauma, traumatic. Well, it is for the, for the, for the normal human killing itself... <laughs> I, I say the normal human killing it, killing in and of itself is traumatic. You, you do have the the few that enjoy it a little too much, but uh, so yeah, killing and any soldier will tell you the first kill they make is probably the the one that will live with them forever. Um, after that, it's just numbers until it's a child. That that, yeah. that changes the nobody's childproof. No. Um, so and I, I this, would, this is a good thing to to realize. PTSD is a normal reaction to trauma. Mm -hmm. Like it 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 isn't an aberrant bad reaction. It's it's what we do, humans. It's a human reaction to a traumatic event that is abnormal. So it's a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. Yeah, exactly. So the more abnormal events you have, the, the more traumatic the event, and I have PTSD questions coming up later. <laughs> Actually, it's the next one, so we're, we're right on track. Um, <laughs> um, so the... <coughs> Individual that's never had any traumatic event that is abducted by aliens, that is chased by a Bigfoot and thinks they're going to die, that is grabbed by the feet by a spirit or another entity and drug, drug out of their bed, could that cause PTSD? Absolutely. It's an abnormal event. You can get PTSD. Okay, so here's what, here's, here's, one of the criteria for PTSD. You have to think that you're going to die or that you're in grave danger. Mm -hmm. And it may not be true. You, it, it's the thinking the it's the thinking that you're going to die, not the actual situation. You may be mistaken. You may be in a bank robbery and be absolutely safe but if you think that you are not and that your life is in danger that is an event that could cause PTSD okay and proximity proximity to the threat like if you're in a bank and you're way across the room from the guy with the gun and there's, you know, there's no line of sight. You're probably less likely to have a an intense reaction than the person that's right beside the guy with the gun. Right. But it's a thought that counts. It's a thought that, <coughs> oh my God, the bullet might hit me anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so it's your perception <clears throat> of the of the possibility of dying or being injured so it's, and you could be it, wrong so it would be safe to say that most of your clients that you have 
involving more traumatic paranormal events are going to result from PTSD as well. They could. And I think it's, it's, in, it's important to look at what their previous issues were. Like, you know, if, if somebody has a really good, solid, never had any trauma, lots of good coping skills, they mm-hmm. may fare better than somebody that's been abused as a child. So do you think having PTSD already is going to be an attractant for malevolent entities, for spirits? I, I won't count alien abduction because that's a whole different category and that's uh, there's different reasons they get abducted. Um, but when it comes to malevolent entities, do you see PTSD as possibly being an attractant for it? I think it opens the door. I do. Okay, I want to add to that question. <laughs> um, let's not just run PTSD through that. What about fears and then also phobias? Would they have be, Would they open the door as well? I think so. Because, it, it, you know, when what we know is that entities feed on base emotions like fear, anger, and they don't feed on love Mm -hmm. and calm. So I think that, you know, if you, if you, if you have a lot of, of fear, the door's open. It lowers the vibration, essentially. Exactly. What about stress? Would stress do that? Could. But, you know, I I don't think it's it's as strong as fear. It's not as tasty. (laughs) Not as tasty? Yeah. To the entity, I mean. Right, right. So do you see emotion such as fear? Uh, do you think that is a, and I hate using the word, but do you think it's a, a food source for some malevolent entities? I think it attracts them. And, and you know, I think... I, I think of them as archons, the ones that really feed on fear and the negative. And And that's a weird, maybe, you know, other people don't term, may use that term. Right. So are there any phobias that would be stronger than the other? So, uh, fear of spiders, for example, fear of ducks looking, watching you <laughs> for another. Um, a freaking duck. <laughs> versus <laughs> the fear of being possessed by a demon, uh, the fear of being abducted by aliens. Uh, do, do you think, uh, you know, anything specific is stronger than the other when it comes to... Uh, I think it's individual, Eric. I, I think it's, you know, I if somebody is just deathly afraid of ducks right it's going to be you know it, it's their perception of it and how much they fear it's we can't really judge from the outside because i think that sounds ridiculous right <laughs> i just thought of a ghost in a duck suit <laughs> <laughs> Does it scare you? It does. Oh. Like, where did he get the duck suit? That part. <laughs> <laughs> um, spirit of Halloween. Oh. <laughs> so, jumping to aliens real quick. Uh, cause, so, I have two questions that come from Nikki. She couldn't be uh, in the chat tonight. Uh, I asked her to come on the show with us as well, but she couldn't make it. Um, but 
And, and I, have you ever worked with clients, uh, 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 abduction clients? I did. W- with you guys. Right, right, right. So she wants to know, how, how does she work with clients who are very angry at being abducted, leaving the fear out of it altogether, but who are very angry about it? I think that anger can be useful because it's empowering. And I think that what you do with a person that's angry is you encourage them to use that anger as a defense. So you kind of you kind of flip it so mm-hmm. that it empowers them. It could be very, very helpful to be angry and to put that that anger into an intention. Do you think anger in that regard is a vibration raiser? No. I think, no. Well... Gosh, that's a good question. Yes, kind of. Because, but it has to be transformed. Like, you can't just have the anger. Right. You need to put it to positive, into a force that's, that, that you're using. So that, you know, anger can, if it's turned inward, can be depression, can be suicide, can right. be... Right? So you want to externalize it and then use it in a positive way to yeah, defend you yourself it in terms for it. Of energy. Yeah. Exactly. So, you're, so if you, you take that. Ex, you need to expel the bad energy, and as you do that, you will gain positive energy. But think of angry energy as a ball of it, as a ball of light or a ball of energy. It's a force. Play. Yeah. You expel that towards the aliens that are making you angry because they're taking you. Yeah. And, and in that way, positive. you're empowering yourself. You're, you're asserting your individuality and your, and your, uh, your right to, sovereign, to be a sovereign being, mm-hmm. right? That's <coughs> ha- I, think, I think it could be used. But it, it, but it has to be. Uh, it has to be focused. It has to be focused, and it can't be focused inward because focused inward right. anger is going to be damaging and bring your energy down. Right. And more susceptible to spirits or abduction or uh, I, I won't even bring crypt- cryptids wouldn't even uh, fit into that paradigm. Um, but that was a good question. It was. And she wants to know what types of exercises and tools do you use or suggest they use to help them work through their anger? We kind of talked about that already. Um, externalizing it, focusing it, teaching teaching about... That the per- that we all have a right to <coughs> not be messed with and to set boundaries. It's real hard for some people to set boundaries. <laughs> it, I mean, gosh, even in like everyday life, it's hard for people to set boundaries because it, we feel victimized. We feel less than. You know, and so what you've got to do w- as far as tools is to to start with, you know, you have a right to assert yourself. You have a right to say, not on my watch, not in my house, not on my property. Mm-hmm. And that's hard for people, especially if they've been victimized in other ways in their life. So, there, you know, the the folks that I worked with, had a real hard time with this because they felt like they were powerless against the aliens. Mm-hmm. And it was real important to get them to a point where they felt like they could take a stand 
and to say, no, this is what I deem, I demand this. But I would have to add to that, in that that is why grounding and shielding, grounding is specifically taught. the negative energy mm-hmm. is key and ideal. Yeah. What? Nothing. <laughs> Um, and I, what do you think, so you've heard a lot of, well, I've heard a lot of negative crap lately about the far right and bashing on yoga teachers and meditation is evil and meditation opens up the door of the devil and, and I'm sorry, I believe in meditation and, well, if I don't do yoga, I don't have the patience for it. But Well, but that's because you haven't met one of the teachers of the satanic yoga. Oh, is that what? Oh, yeah. God damn it. <laughs> so, what's your thoughts? Do you think meditation, uh, I, I find meditation, uh, although I can't really do it unless I'm using Native American drum, but <laughs> I find meditation as enlightenment to an extent. Um, do you I find it think, opening up negative doors? No, not at all. And I think that the way that you deal with that kind of thing is, you it, you know, it's if they don't like the, th- the thinking of meditation, then let's talk about prayer. <laughs> you know, you change the paradigm to what they're able to understand and accept. It's mm-hmm. the same... It's the same energy. We're just going to call it something different. We're going to call it what you're comfortable with. Well, words are power. Mm-hmm. And prayer, chants, spells yeah. are all the same thing. They are it's all intention. Energy. Yeah. It's focused intention in a positive way, no matter what you call it. What? Cole, you're shaking his head. What? As a pagan, uh-huh. does your leader give you a cracker after you say a, pr- a spell? Because mine does. <laughs> I get a cracker and some wine. We have llamas bread. So <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, tit for tat. <laughs> but no, I don't get a wafer that's the body of Christ every time I go say a prayer. I'm just saying, if I do my prayers, I get a snack. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we have an interesting show sometimes. <laughs> oh, the Catholic and the Pagan. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow, that could be a reality show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it would. Catholic and the Pagan walked into it. Oh. And it's called S4. <laughs> but I think it'd be better as a primetime sitcom. <laughs> it's called oh. S4. <laughs> Every Sunday night, 7 o'clock. <laughs> oh. Oh, so her third question, yeah, she wasn't done. <laughs> Have any of the female abductees who are in any of the baby programs, she refer, she's referring to the gray hybrid program, mm-hmm. uh, wanted their child, even though the baby is an alien human hybrid? And I'm not sure if you ever had clients in the hybrid I'm, program, uh, did you? No, I didn't. So I really can't answer that. I I don't have the background. I defer that to somebody else. So it has been our experience. The couple cases we did have, they knew their daughter was a hybrid. The child... Uh, I'm, I'm careful about my wording. but Yeah, you got to be careful. The child... And, didn't know she was a hybrid. But the parents were perfectly okay with it. Um, and Do they get, re- is there a choice, Eric? Is, no, there's, is, there's not. So in the 90s, with the gray hybrid program, the, 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 the males were forced to ejaculate, and they did use semen. But the females, and they were both taken... Uh, and it would come back in dream state if they remembered anything at all. Um, but the females would be impregnated. They'd be they'd, they'd be returned. Um, there would be a, a 
a normal pregnancy for about three months, and then they'd be reabducted, and the fetus would be taken out, and they'd be returned. Now, the only evidence of, and I'm watching the clock here, and we might have to carry on this conversation after the uh, top of the hour. Yeah, just keep going. But the, the only evidence that anything happened was, one, their dreams, which is why I, I always encouraged uh, abductees to keep a dream journal, because that's the first step towards conscious recall. Um, mm -hmm. But three months would be about the gestation period, and then they would the, the fetus would be taken out, and they'd be returned. And within two, three months, they'd be reabducted and encouraged to play with this toddler appearing child. Um, I guess it was about 10 or 10 years ago, maybe a little more, they changed to where the woman would be abducted, impregnated, and left on earth to have a natural childbirth. So what you see today are alien hybrid children that are being uh, there, there, there's a natural childbirth with their natural earth mother. And their eyes are a little bit different. They're a little bit bigger, a little bit brighter. Um, and the kids are a little more psychic. They're a little more, I guess, open. They don't know they're hybrids. Uh, the only reason this particular client had known their child was special or might be a hybrid was... Because they knew, he knew his wife had been abducted about the time that she became pregnant. And that was the only way they put two and two together. Um, but the child had no idea she was a hybrid. And they were asking me, do we tell her? And I told them, you know what? I would leave it until you will know when the time is right. What else do you tell them? So, what do you see with that from a therapeutic perspective? And we're going to go ahead and go to break, and we'll come back to this question uh, and carry on this conversation. So be hey, everyone. Of... Cole here with S4. Make sure you join us March 27th through 29th, 2020 in Seaside, Oregon, at the Oregon Ghost Conference. This is their ninth year running, with a lot of great things happening, including speakers, vendors, events, and workshops that you can all get in on. So make sure you get your tickets soon at www.oregonghostconference.com. We'll see you there. You are listening to S4 on Spreaker.com They say I'm evil They say I'm dead inside Check out my ego Cause I'm rotted here tonight Just burn me like a witch And watch as I catch fire But I cannot die I am your poltergeist Poltergeist, Poltergeist, 
Welcome back to S4. Go check out our store. We have all kinds of gear you can get. Mugs. Actually, while I'm on that, we still have Paracon t-shirts. If you want, uh, we are putting the pictures up of the Paracon t-shirts on the FMP group. Um, $20 will get you. We have everything from 5X down to small. So uh, watch for the, the ad when it goes up and get your Paracon uh, memorabilia today. Uh, but if you want your S4 mug, www.s-4radio.com. Anyway, tonight or we're talking. Curtain. What? Or shower curtain. Or shower curtain. There's I, a really yeah. awesome troll one. I, I still don't have my shower curtain. Me neither. Or my throw rug. I'm going to get one. Don't you I'm want to? I'm allowed to get one. Don't you want an S4 shower camera. curtain, Francie? What? What? Don't you want your S4 shower curtain? Yes, I do. <laughs> And see, even Francie wants one, Kayla. Right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> bathroom has a theme. Everyone, tonight, today was Francie's birthday. Oh my God! So we got to sing Happy Birthday. One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you, Francie. Happy, happy birthday to you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, dear Francie. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Da, 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 da. How lovely. Thank you so much. And you're going to the beach for your birthday, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I, I tried to make it last for a month. I, you know, I don't see anything wrong with that. Yeah, Happy birth month. Exactly. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, exactly. there you go. So, getting back to the, the uh, hybrid... Um, what's your thoughts as a therapist? I mean, if you, so if you had someone bring their child to you and they told you that they thought their child was an alien hybrid, 
how would you approach that from a therapeutic point of view? I think your idea of waiting to see when the time was right and that they would know is a perfect solution. You kind of, I, I, when you were explaining that, it's, it, it reminded me of adoption. You know, you, it kind of you, is. Uh, it is. I mean, it's it's like you want to tell the child what they can understand, when they can understand it, and you don't tell them. You know, you don't over over share. You wait until they're interested, and you know, at some point. They may wonder if they're different. Cool, cool, and killer. And, the, and that would be a perfect <laughs> opening, right? Well, <laughs> so, what's, so what's your argument? Uh, personal experience as a parent, that whole you're gonna know when the time is right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, freaking not. So really? what? You're, you're gonna? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, we well, were totally wrong. I, I get that, but what are you going to do? Sit him down and say, "Oh, I'm sorry, your uh, your father was an alien." Well, I wouldn't go that far, but I would start <laughs> introducing him to the subject. But that's what you do with adoption. What well, you know, and if I if I recall right, I think they already had. They had already uh, kind of brought up the topic of aliens and and uh, there might be life in other planets. I, I th- mm-hmm. believe they'd already kind of approached that. So they just kind of the brought problem spectrum is approach. it's a very yeah. fine line of that age where it is right because there is a point in adolescence where you're from birth up. You're sitting there, and everything is what my parents say is right, what my parents say is right. And then it is like a one-day switch where, oh, those guys are idiots. And it's about <laughs> 14. <laughs> depends on the kid. Oh, I tell you, it's a little younger than 14 for some of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there, it, it's that way for quite a while, and then it switches back. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. you, you end up being in your 20s and you're like, oh, my parents Crap, right. I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so do you think <coughs> holding back could potentially make the child angry? That they weren't told? That, that's a weird subject. When you're when you're looking at a culture of people that don't even believe there's other there's life on other planets, and you're an abduct and and you're an alien hybrid, see, and that's the problem is that part of it has no connection to adoption because if you're adopted, your parents have proof. There is concrete proof. I know you didn't come out of me. Yeah. But when it's something with an alien hybrid program, what proof does your parent have that that's true? They they, they don't. have their own belief. That's it. Well, exactly because their alien their their DNA is going to be human DNA, and I do believe that has to do with the implant. Now, is it going to be human DNA, and is it going to be fifty percent of each of their DNA, it's just like a normal? Child would be so with this child, it uh-huh. was human DNA, and, I, and we've talked about this on the show too. Mm-hmm. Is that I believe they have an implant that keeps their DNA right, and that's what I'm saying. I understand that it was human DNA, but is it human DNA 50% the mother and 50% the father? I don't know, or is it 50% to... the mother and I, I would say DNA. maybe the first five weren't. It's all alien to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would say the first five, maybe five or six weren't, and then they realized, oh, maybe we should fix that because like they're already doing the implants. You'd think if they've gone that far, they're gonna think that far ahead too. You figure the first documented. I, I know you're gonna argue back because there, there's uh, you know cave paintings of abduction, but look look at Betty and Barney Hill for example. That that was back in the sixties. 
that was there wasn't an implant, there wasn't a uh, a fetus, there wasn't that we know of. Yeah. Um, so I'd imagine the abductees back in the nineties had, and they they show pictures. Uh, they've actually drawn pictures of what these the toddlers looked very alien. So I'm sure it took. Well, well, just like our technology, it, it's it's always increasing and it's growing and it's getting well, better with time. So I would assume that everybody's does. And that makes me wonder because science is a trial and error program, mm -hmm. <laughs> always. So, like the first couple times, did they always do it with the female? <laughs> you mean did they try to impregnate a male? Yeah, <laughs> that'd be kind of creepy, wouldn't it? Well, to be bit honest, they, they might not know the difference in the beginning. <laughs> but but I think they would. Like, I is mean, that if where you the look idea for the movie go, Twins hey, came from? from? Like, here we go. You know. Oh. Not Twins. What was the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger where he was pregnant? Was that Twins? No. Twins was the one with the little short guy. Danny DeVito. There we go. <laughs> he was in twi the, the pregnant one, too. Yeah, but that was Junior. Junior, that's it. Oh, okay. I think I remember that one. Yeah, he was the first man to have a baby. Okay, but you know, so thinking about the, the hybrid program and when it's right to tell a child and everything like that, it, I think that if we're going off the basis of like adoption and that, and we're taking that into consideration, or like even uh, a stepchild that wouldn't necessarily know like their mother or their father. Okay, um, I think that it all depends on the kid and when the time is right for the specific person. Because there are exactly. certain people, and there's certain children out there that, like, they go, hey, why does this look different on me or that look different on me? And they ask about it. Hey, well, what are you going to tell them? You're going to have to say, hey, well, you know, here's here's what happened and why. Mm -hmm. and so I think so, and that, I think the, I think yeah. you're right. Exactly, and I think it you you have to come from the what's good for the child, what the child needs, not what the parent needs. Mm -hmm. But and, and to be you, honest, you go and, from where, okay. where the child is and what they need. What what do they what information do they need at that point? Mm -hmm. Well, in a case like that too, if if they're not a believer in any of that stuff, if they have no interest in it, they don't want to know about it. They don't care about alien races they don't care about any of this stuff maybe there's never a good time to tell that person mm -hmm. because that might yeah. actually just cause them to have a mental breakdown because of the fact that they don't believe in something that they supposedly are and then cps you know. gonna come in and take them away anyway potentially <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> but, oh but i don't know that i would even bring that up until they personally ask about it. And in this particular case, the child had shown signs of interest. Okay. So, yeah. I think you take your cues from the kid. From the situation. From the you know, situation, I yeah. I think that's any human being, though. Like, anything that you're talking about to anybody, you got to take your cues from them. Yeah. Because you don't mm -hmm. want to bring up religion or politics or any of these taboo things with somebody who isn't into any of it or who yeah. will fight till the bitter end with it because then what's the point there's no point in discussing if somebody is completely one-sided about something yeah and you have to be careful about not inserting your agenda on the child Right. If you have an agenda. I would hope they don't have an agenda. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe one of their parents does if we're going hybrid style. All right. There would have to be some form of agenda or you wouldn't have made a hybrid in the first place, wouldn't you think? Uh, that wasn't their uh, decision. No, no. I'm talking, <laughs> I'm talking the other side of that equation. That There has to be some reason for it happening. For the hybrid program? Right. So I mean, so there's a whole so lot there'd of always there's always a whole, be there's a whole lot of different Are theories sure? out there. What do you think an alien just accidentally impregnated <laughs> somebody? I mean, I guess it's always a possibility, but 
How did I've... deep fried prick Twinkies come into being, Kayla? Oh, uh, some guy was eating a Twinkie right over the deep fryer and went, oh, crap. <laughs> that was my last Twinkie and I'm hungry. I'm going to eat was, it anyways. He, I guarantee he was stoned. That's the thing. <laughs> Do we know, honestly, how intelligent these beings are? Like, they may have amazing technology, but the guy's using it. <laughs> well, you know, I've actually thought about that on occasion, too, where everybody's like, oh, they're so much more intelligent. They're so much more powerful. They're so much more... There has to be one really stupid race out there. And, I mean, <laughs> like, it might be us. That's a terrifying I think it's thought. us. <laughs> but... <laughs> But there's got to be that one race out there that's like, hmm, hey, hold my beer, I got this. The rednecks okay. of the galaxy. Exactly. And who knows, maybe he's just sitting there like, I wonder what would happen. <laughs> what does this button do? Ooh. <laughs> All right, so how do you feel about contactees versus abductees? So the contactors are the ones who claim a wonderful <coughs> experience versus the abductees who have a traumatic one. So do you think Stockholm Syndrome could play a factor in the contactees? Or do you think there are wonderful experiences? Mm. I don't know. I, I have a theory. <laughs> and that's the fact that so thinking of an abduction from a scientific point of view if when you think of any time someone's captured in a movie or anything like that not by aliens but by another another human yeah mind eraser like they always erase their minds so they don't remember what's going on <laughs> so maybe they're implanting good memories of it into their minds and the ones that are actually considered abductees are the ones that didn't take so that's a possibility that's, that's really interesting yeah. like maybe it's the more powerful minds that aren't taking too because think about it your IQ level is based off basic intelligence mm-hmm so what if those are people who have a higher IQ? They may not be smarter, they may not be uh, book smarter or anything like that, but they have a higher IQ, which makes it so that their mind doesn't break to that implant as much as some others. It's a possibility. I mean, look at look at the uh, screen memory they use. Yeah. yeah. Some people remember deer and owls. And, and those are a lot of abductees. What if that's part of it? Huh? What if that's actually part of that uh, implant that it's still kind of holding? Yeah. Uh, you know, well, okay. So if you look at actual abduction, like a person-on-person abduction, okay, there are some people that believe that they're helping a person, taking them out of a situation or whatever. And that's why they've abducted this person. Not necessarily because they're maliciously trying to do something, but they're trying to help them in some way. Uh, Maybe there are specific, what you would call like savior races that are running around out there that are taking specific people that need some form of somebody there for them. And that gives them a purpose, that gives them a reason. You know? I think it depends on the race. Again, we always say that. And I do think there are good races out there. The Arterians, the, uh, oh God, my, 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 the, the numbers are limited, but <laughs> the Arterians, the Pleiadians, uh, the ones you hear all. Wookies. The Wookies, yeah. We'll, we'll go with Wookies. <laughs> um, but, you know. They're fancy. Oh, what, what's interesting is when you get attacked for uh, how dare you say aliens are evil well some of them are no there's no such thing as bad aliens that would be like saying there's no such thing as bad people 
I think in any race, it doesn't matter if you're an alien or if you're a human being or you're an animal. Uh, I think there's good and bad in every race. Some skunks don't spray. Right. Wow, well, that's like saying there's no carnivorous aliens. Well, no, you can't say that because all the ones that met them didn't come back. Exactly. <laughs> How to exactly. cook a human, volume two. <sighs> okay, so enough about aliens for now. What? Do you think there's an alien, Gordon Ramsay? Put that human back in the oven. He's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh. God. I have great questions. <laughs> you didn't cut his pinky off. Oh, yeah. That would be the tech legs. So, do you see children as being more influenced by paranormal than adults? And how should parents address it? I think they're more tuned in because I think, you know, I think we get, like we were talking about earlier, that you you take in more than you actually see. I think they're more tuned in. They're more open. Their channel is more open. They They don't, they haven't been told that they can't yet. Mm-hmm. And that's why uh, children are more in tune with seeing fairies, for example. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and and our pets too. But your pets, it never goes away. Well, no, because they're never right. told no. Okay, so is it is it okay? I'm not, I'm not sure if this is correct. Or if not. your pet's looking down the hallway, you don't say, "Hey, stop it." <laughs> well, I do, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, the the fourth dimension vision never goes away, even as they get older. Whereas with humans, it seems to close up. Because but we do you think do you think it, influence. Do you think it closes up because of society's influence? Yes. Really? I or do don't. you think it's physical or mental? I think in that case, I think we we teach them not to be open. Think about the biggest influence on children for the paranormal. Scooby Doo. What are you told at the end of every episode? Oh no, I don't remember. Let's pull his mask off. Let's see who he is. Oh, oh well, yeah. And yeah. it's always a human being. Not in Yokai yeah. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> yokai Watch is always a ghost. But you know what I mean? Like Scooby Doo has always taught that it's always human. It's never mm-hmm. an actual ghost. And you know that's what's interesting. You look at cartoons back then versus today. <sighs> Scooby Doo, it's always fake. Today it's not. And you know, I I honestly, we're bringing it back to your question in mm. the first place. Um, I don't think that it has as much to do with society as people might think it does. I honestly believe that the reason that most children <clears throat> can see things that adults can't is their brain is still forming. Their synapses are firing at a way higher rate than ours are. They're building on that. And if you have that mm-hmm. much more electricity going through something, then it's going to be at a higher frequency. So maybe the reason that they see more things, maybe the reason that they can perceive things that we can't is because they actually can. Because the synapses are firing way faster than ours are. So it's more of an organic, physical right. thing. I would have to hmm. argue with that because I've met a few people who I truly believe did have a paranormal experience. And I also truly believe that their synapses weren't fucking firing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but that leads to my next question. From a cognitive perspective, why is it that some adults seem just as open as children in paranormal perception? 
because of the bridges that were formed. Like I said, when you when you're when you're a kid and your brain is doing its thing and it's saying, "Hey, this is this, this is that," memory bank that, memory bank that. I think that there are certain people that this is where the society part of that does come into hand, mm-hmm. where they weren't necessarily told that. <coughs> oh no, that monster that's under your bed doesn't exist. You Monst- know, monster Zeke, or whatever it is. Monster so Zeke. <laughs> that pathway never closed. Mm-hmm. So when they go into adulthood, well, they try to say, "Oh yeah, it's not real" or whatever, but you still have the same pathway there. So, do you think <coughs> belief, religion, has anything to play in that? Uh-huh. It's indoctrination. Both of yeah. those are. And when you're indoctrinated, you are taught to think a certain way. And it closes down other avenues. So, doors. Look, I mean, gosh, we, we teach our kids, our girls to like pink and our boys to like blue. You know, I mean, we indoctrinate the heck out of our kids from the beer, from little mm-hmm. about, you know, society's expectations. And, and we do it without thinking about it. So yeah. I think that, that they do get shut down. I, I'd say even when we're trying not to do it, because we're still doing it, because even like with the blue and pink thing, even if you try and make pink an okay color for boys, you still like you still use that same almost uh, thought process that it's not only tough guys color. wear pink. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For in, in high school, I had pink shirts, but in high school... I was one of the biggest kids. Who the hell was going to argue with me? <laughs> <laughs> you could do it if you wanted to. <laughs> right. <clears throat> and that's what, like, I've always told my boys. Like, they got a couple pink shirts throughout the years, and I said, tough guys wear pink. Mm-hmm. You want to be a tough guy? Mm-hmm. You wear pink. Friend. Who's going to tell but you Go otherwise? find a pink shirt. for. I mean, like, that's the other thing. The, the toys are so, you know, mm-hmm. boy and girl, they're not. Uh, you have to really work to find a... a you know, I, I would say not as much as they used to be. Not... Um, right. It depends on the toy. Like, Truth be told, I Guns. never wanted any of my boys wear playing with a Barbie. Not for the reason that you would automatically come to, that it's a girl's toy. It's because it has a girl's figure. They hold on to that Barbie mm-hmm. till they're 13. Eventually, they're taking it into the bathroom with them. We got problems. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it, honestly, that was my thought process when it came to that. Is like, I, I, I didn't want them knowing that anatomy as quickly as they could learn. Mm-hmm. Um, small dolls, like baby dolls, they all had. Mm-hmm. But... Barbies I wasn't okay with because of how well endowed she was. <laughs> For in, but we've never had a problem. Um, our son is what you would call a brony. Have you ever heard that t- term, Francie? No. So it is a boy who is into, and I mean heavily into, My Little Pony. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, and it's like when you when you first hear it, it seems like it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a thing. It is a big thing. When you go to conventions like Comic Con, they have their own floor. Bronies. Yeah, oh yeah. Yep. And they dress up, and it's not just young boys. These are like thirty year old men who dress up as a My Little Pony. They had collect all the toys. They watch <laughs> all the shows. Cool. Yeah, like it, um, he has got made fun of it. For it in school, and all we were able to tell him was, it'll be easier when you get to college. When you find your people, yeah, yeah, you'll be fine. I tell my kids that all the time. Um, whenever they have something <coughs> that they do that isn't necessarily society deemed okay for them to do, 
you know, as far as the gender roles go or as far as Mm -hmm. my son wanted to join the cheerleading team. I said, go for it. You know, and once you find your group of people, they aren't going to care if you're a cheerleader or you're the quarterback. Yeah. That's your group of people. Like, and it, I explained to him that it takes time to find them. Like, frick, I've been here 10 years. I finally found, like, and the way we always put it is find your weirdo. <laughs> find your fellow weirdo. And I found you, Eric. Uh-huh. It took me 10 years, but I found my fellow weirdo. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it, in that sense, because of that, because we do try and um, mold to society mold to society mm-hmm. that's what makes me still think that society has a huge part to play in the fact that our minds close up I think so and it's sad I mean it, it, it's really sad because along with that goes creativity and you know, individual individuality and right. And if you do keep that. them into your adulthood, then they call you eccentric or they call you crazy or they label you something different. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, so, we all do that in in our family. We do that anyways. But oh, that's yeah, we just do. like we're weird, is it? We my dad it. has constantly been <laughs> funny since I was eight years old because I like Star Wars. Um, he has never been into it. He's watched every movie with me. But he absolutely hates them. <laughs> but I'm his son, so he'll make fun of me for it. But he always bought me every toy that they had of him when I was a kid. and for in... Sat through the grueling movie like we do with Kimberly and the damn... Oh, Frozen. God, Frozen. Frozen. <laughs> Everything Frozen. I hate that show. <laughs> I don't. It has trolls in it. Right? Exactly. <laughs> so do you think fairies play a role in keeping kids more open? In keeping kids what? More open. I think <clears throat> all of them. Elementals. Yeah. And mm-hmm. spirits. Huh? And spirits. I think the ancestral spirits do. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Because, uh, you know, how many cases... You can't argue that. How many cases do we know of where you've got a, a three or four-year-old that's talking and can describe... Uh, I'll use Grandma Janie, for example. You, you know, never met Grandma Janie. never seen pictures of Grandma Janie, but it's describing Grandma Janie. It happens a lot. It does. So uh, you, I think you're right. I think ancestral spirits will come to kids because they're guardians. These are the guardians. They're spirits. guardians, right? Usually, not always, but usually, they're there to check up on their grandkids or the great great grand. You know, I will say it's getting a little bit more and more <clears throat> lax because this generation, uh, the generation that's in charge right now, thirty-five to forty-year-olds. Um, we aren't as heavily guarded with it that this is not real. No matter, I don't care what you say, you get rid of these thoughts. We're more accepting. Yeah. And throughout each generation, it is going to get better. And I would agree. Um, you, you know, and so me being the paramo weirdo of concrete. I'm sure you guys got here. Yeah. yeah. Um, Thanks for passing the torch. <laughs> <laughs> well, before your kids went to the school here, mm-hmm. our kids, Cheyenne and Anthony, didn't get teased. But, oh, you're, you're, your dad's a ghost guy. Or your, your dad's an alien guy. And, you know, and there were teachers that were actually more accepting than the students were. Yeah, there are teachers that were more excited about the fact that we we're paranormal than the students were. But that's because the teachers of concrete are fairly young too. They are. True. They're all really yeah. young, actually. True. Is it better now? 
than it was? Basically, because, you know, Cole and Kayla's kids go to the school, so, you know, all of a sudden they're all wearing their Paracon shirts to the, to the school, and, well, when you have six kids and they're all wearing Paracon shirts, harder to... All in different grades. Yeah, all in different grades, but... You know, it's harder to tease them when, oh, well, shit, there's three other kids wearing the same Bigfoot shirt. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, there, there's not a minority, there's still a minority in the school, but, uh, it, you know, it's it's seen as not accepting, but, oh, we, we won't tease them because there's other kids with the same shirt. Well, mm-hmm. probably also helped that both uh, Jayla, John, and Hunter were like, what, you going to pick on my little sister? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. And they take Shy into that, too, where they're like, oh, these two, too. No, those are mine. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> you know? so, it works out pretty good for them, I think, in the end. It All does. Of them. And it, we haven't had does. the complete talk. Like, I don't know, honestly know how much our kids believe. What about every, paranormal? Yeah. Uh, honestly, like, um, we haven't had the complete talk with each of them. Um, I wonder about a few of them. Like, Jalen played a trick on his mom. <laughs> oh, okay. He had her completely believing that he time traveled. <laughs> um, okay, he's nice. really good at research. He is really good at research, man. You can yeah, tell he, me everything about this city. Well, everything. He, he went about back this. to Crenshaw, but you've also got him reading paranormal books. Yes, he. But well, he watched. He likes messing but, with me anyway. He, he had her convinced that he watched uh, Biggie get shot on Crenshaw Avenue. He told me in and, detail everything about it from the <laughs> viewpoint, everything, and he had just been researching but a he, lot. He did <laughs> mess up, and that's where he got caught. But like, it was a half an hour conversation they had where she was nodding. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, well, I'm not going to tell him that he wasn't there. If he was, I mean, <clears throat> tell me about it. Let me know what you say. You know. So, from a Psychiatric perspective, what would you tell parents uh, as far as kids experiencing paranormal? Gosh, it, it really depends on what the, the parents believe, doesn't it? I mean, like, if they're open to it, they're going to, they're, they have more, you, you've got more to work with mm-hmm. than if they're closed to it. And, you know, it kind of goes back to what we were talking before. You go not from what the parents want, but what's good for the child. What does the, what does the child need? Do they need to be listened to? You know, let, let them tell their story because kids, how do you know if it's imagination or if it's real? Mm-hmm. You you listen. That's what they need. They need to be listened to. Well, and realistically, even if it's imagination, it might be real to them. They see a yeah. friend as an imaginary friend. You say, oh, okay, there's nobody there, right? But Right, but you're not you going to shut them down. Right. The good parent wouldn't. I'll say that. Well... And, like, if if we're, as a team or as a community working with somebody, you know, you're going to want to to get them away from from whatever agenda that they might have and focus in on the kid, what's good for the kid. Mm -hmm. You can't go wrong that way. If 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 you try to go from... You know, what does the child need in this situation? You really can't make a a bad decision. I just remember the two cases that we had. They happened, it was weird because they happened the same day, but the two cases we had where we called CPS in on the the parents. Mm Mm-hmm. And that happened the same day in two different states. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But there were issues that were... (laughs) <laughs> Pretty apparent. 
and then I remember also the the case that specifically you know is still stuck in my head is the four year old that for four years stayed in the same bedroom, and then all of a sudden is terrified of that bedroom. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, you've got the family dog, the family cat, that is also terrified of the same room. Yeah. That Either that or the kid's been watching the home channel, like the home uh, building channel, mm-hmm. and it's the colors. <laughs> the cat too, though. <laughs> Maybe the cat was watched with him. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, you have to look at the, the 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 big picture. Well, I think any good parent is going to try as hard as they can and to make sure that their kid isn't in pain. I, I mean, I'm honestly mm. like anytime your kid is crying, you're automatic as a good parent. You go, Hey, uh, what's wrong? Why are you crying? What's going on? Yeah. You know? So I think that everybody is trying to help their children as far as that goes. But if you don't know enough about it yourself, well, just like how those people reached out to somebody because they didn't know what was going on. Mm-hmm. So I don't know enough about this. I'm going to reach out to a professional or to this person or to that person that might know more about it. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's jump. No. We're not going to jump? We break through the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so with alien, go, jumping back to alien abduction real quick. With alien abduction, we see parallels in abductees between drug and child abuse. With abduction signs, do you see a psychiatric condition which could also be seen as a parallel? Schizophrenia. Thought disorders. And that's, I mean, you're faced with the question of is this an illness or is this real or is this a person with an illness that is having a real experience which is also possible how do you bipolarism huh bipolar disorder people with bipolar disorder can have delusions and hallucinations but it's not it's it's a mood disorder, not necessarily a thought disorder. Schizophrenia is definitely a thought disorder. You can have um, delusions and hallucinations with bipolar, but it's not. But okay, always be, the case. Um, like thinking of a certain entity, like a um, energy vamp. Could that be? the cause of a mood disorder instead of an actual bipolar problem? I guess what I'm asking is there's an actual medical test to test for bipolar disorder? No. It's all subjective. So it's a possibility that it could be like an energy vamp that just keeps coming around at certain times and it's diagnosed as bipolar disorder. It could be, but you're not going to, they're going to treat it as yeah, a, totally an illness. Meds. So basically if the medication fixes a problem, then it's bipolar and it's not paranormal per se. No, then well, again, there's the no. placebo effect on that because it would be whatever intention you were putting in on it. So if you believe something's well, going to work so hard. <laughs> So we, uh, I, with the team, I, I helped a couple of people that were taking medications and who were having hallucinations, not which we thought were probably, well, we didn't know for sure. And I encouraged them to take their medications regularly because they the medication can act as a damper on the paranormal mm-hmm. so well and we always encourage people to take their medications because we're not going to get in the middle of a patient and their doctor no we're going to support what the doctor <clears throat> has told them to do but the medications can help the person 
control the paranormal. Mm-hmm. Well, now, they, if they're taking their medications and they're still experiencing the paranormal, then, well, then <laughs> obviously it's probably paranormal. Yeah. Now, Shara's in the chat room, and she wants to know: Is uh, do you think de uh, aliens are demonic, or do you think aliens are aliens? Did you I ever cross? Did aliens. you ever cross that? Did I demonic? Yeah. Do you think aliens are demon, or do you think aliens are a completely separate race? I think they're separate races. <laughs> I think there are. I don't know. I mean, I I have seen psych patients that I thought were possessed, mm -hmm. but they. I, I don't know about the alien thing. I have always assumed, and I'm I'm not an expert by any means. Right. Mark was ready. You want to wait till the break? Yeah. Uh, so we're going to bring Mark in at the top of the hour. It's fifteen minutes away. Um, he's ready to come in. But in regard to aliens and demons, they are two separate races. We have found that out from uh, from our, the the team we ran uh, that demons do demons and aliens, depending on the race, obviously, of alien. But reptilians and demons are enemies. They they hate each other. They literally despise each other. Hmm. Um, they are two separate. Entities, for lack of a better word, uh, demons are their own race. There's good demons, believe it or not. Um, people hate it when I say that, but there are good demons. There's people, there's humans that actually work with demons. Um, so are 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 demons earthbound? Like they have, they have their own realm. They do have their okay. own realm. So they're more like fairy, huh? So they're more like fey. No. No. No, they have their own realm, but they're able to cross to this one. They can, they can cross, like any other entity. So they're just an interdimensional creature. Essentially. Okay. Uh, I, 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 interdimensional gets used too much. They have their own dimension, but they can cross, they can leave their dimension and come here. Okay, so they're barrier crossers. Oh, yeah. Then. All right. They're just mm. here for the stoves. Hmm. It's like the in so, and out of their world. <laughs> Um, so, Shar is asking, uh, are, are demons causing people symptoms? They can. Definitely. So, what's... And, and, and it can look like schizophrenia, and it can look like hallucinations, and it can look like Charlie Manson, and... <laughs> <There's> <laughs> That's a look. not exactly. as popular, is it? What's that? Demon, the, the demons being the cause. No. Not as it's made out to be. No, because you watch any paranormal TV show and everything is a demon. Everything. Not just paranormal TV shows. Like, you watch anything well, movies. that is a face on the earth in a movie, it's usually associated with the demon at least once in the movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even Alien, the movie Aliens. And, the Mexican oh, guy yeah, 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 yeah. did call it a demon. Yeah. And you know the statistics. When FMP ran cases at five cases a day for 365 days a year, we might have two that were actually truly demonic cases. Mm -hmm. I didn't see one since we joined. Since I joined. no, exactly. And and, and Eric, that is probably the same percentage as psych patients to demons. Mm -hmm. So very, demonic very possession, few. Demonic possession could honestly be schizophrenia. True, or no? Mm, no, I I would say not. Not. I mean, it could be, but the same percentage, very very small. Schizophrenia <laughs> is much more understood now than right. it than it used to be, and it's it's a brain thing. It's a it's a brain imbalance. It's a brain thing. Mm hmm. And, oh, there's Nikki. Nikki says, yes, demons can cross numerous boundaries. Uh, yeah, they're, Hi, they're, they're a dimensional creature. They can, and, uh, 
entity. I don't like to use the word creature. Um, they work with humans. Some of them despise humans. A lot of them despise humans, but I despise humans, so I don't blame them. Um, <laughs> <coughs> but, yeah, and Markham says demons are nothing like the Christian church would have you think they are. Absolutely. Uh, they they get the brunt of every negative thing because of religion. It's religion mm -hmm. that actually made demons out to what people perceive them as they are today. Um, and again, they are highly rare. They truly demonic cases. So the way they work, the ones that do attack humans, the lower dimensional demons, are nasty creatures. The higher level demons don't attack humans they work on your psyche they're the ones that will cause depression they're the ones that will cause you to kill yourself um, through depression they, that's how they work the lower ones are the ones that you can very easily misconstrue as a spirit or another malevolent entity type what's um, the payoff for them why do they do that It depends on the demon. Uh, to feed on the soul? To feed on the energy? Mm -hmm. So it's their food mm -hmm. source. They're definitely not vegan. No, they definitely aren't vegan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's one vegan just sitting there, sipping on his chai tea. Nope, mm. he wasted away. <laughs> and, and, and Markham says a lot of crossover between demons and jinn. There is, but the jinn are much, much, <coughs> much worse than the demons. Uh, Jin are a hundred percent trickster. Jin can um, so what again? I believe that honestly comes down to the historical um, findings because there they are different types of jinn. They definitely ain't genies in a bottle. No, <laughs> but there is such thing as a gin. There is such thing as a pleasure gin, which they're only. Um, they feed off sexual energy. Yes, but at the same time, because of that, <clears throat> they have to give pleasure to their master. They have to give that pleasure in order to feed off of it. Uh, you think of a succubus and incubus? No. Okay. No. Nope. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this would be northern India. Okay. We need to find somebody in India to come on the show. Okay. Uh, I already have a couple ideas. Me too. That's why cool. I said okay. Right on. <laughs> you start calling numbers, someone will pick up. <laughs> oh. So... We're going to bring Markham on here in seven minutes. And Francie. Yes. What's been your experience with Bigfoot in Idaho? And what do you think Bigfoot oh. is? Okay, so where <laughs> I live, there is a mountain right next to our little lake town. And a friend and I were driving the Forest Service roads up there, and we think we were close to one. Ooh, any tracks? No. It was weird. Okay, so the energy of this... This sounds crazy. <laughs> the energy of the area changed. Ooh. Almost like a... It wasn't a sound, but it, it as if there was a buzzing. Like it was a... An a almost electric... Yeah. Yeah. And an odd smell. Just mm -hmm. kind of wafted over us. It didn't smell like sulfur, and did it? It smelled like what? Sulfur. No. 
No, Good. it was more like kind of musky, dead. Yeah, well, kind of like dead meaty, musky, earthy, musky, like meat. So kind of like rotten flesh. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, that's and that's, that's more like roadkill. We got. Do you think? Yeah, yeah. actually, the <laughs> rotten, fleshy smell is associated more with a reptilian. Yeah, than, that's what than I a smelled. Foot. The two. Uh, also, yeah. the energy change is more with a reptilian type than a big foot. Yeah. Usually. Oh, okay. And the fact well, that you that- had a but. The fact that you had a buzzing noise, that sounds more alien to me as well. So I'd say that was more uh, reptilian than Bigfoot. Bigfoot, okay. from my experiences, has always been more of a skunky bear smell. Like a cross yeah, between the, that. The, the skunk and a wet dog. That could also depend mm-hmm. on the geographical location. The smells will change even with any creature. It could. It could. But going by... So the, in that- we just got the hell smell. out of there really quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, the thing that gets me on, on your story is, is the change of energy. Oh, yeah. Because uh, usually somebody with a Bigfoot sighting doesn't necessarily have a huge change of energy. No. But somebody with a reptilian sighting usually feels either drained or has something in the air that feels wrong mm-hmm. before they smell that smell. Yeah, it, it felt wrong. Like... N- like you're being shouldn't watched, have been there. But not really. And we gotta have Markham talk about his first Bigfoot knock. With that, um, <laughs> so hmm. it's time for break. It is, but first, uh, everyone on all of our listeners, uh, fairly well known Nikki. Um, so Nikki's mom went into the hospital last week. So if you could all send um, healing thoughts towards her, that would be excellent. Um, Nikki, we hope your mom's doing well, and we hope she gets better real quick. So with that, we are going to go to our second break, and we will be back. Hey everyone, Cole here with S4. Make sure you join us March 27th through 29th, 2020, in Seaside, Oregon, at the Oregon Ghost Conference. This is their ninth year running, with a lot of great things happening, including speakers, vendors, events and workshops that you can all get in on. So make sure you get your tickets soon at www.oregonghostconference.com. We'll see you there. You are listening to S4 on Spreaker.com.
Welcome back to Espero with your host, Eric Cooper. Welcome back to S4. If you don't have your uh, S4 gear, make sure you check out the store at the website and go join our YouTube channel. I don't have the link in front of me, but just go on YouTube and look for S-4. And you've heard the ads. Make sure you join us at Oregon Ghost Con in Seaside, Oregon, May March 27th to 29th. Yep. Tickets go yep. on sale Monday. And we'll go over some of those at the end of the show, some of the other stuff we're going to be going to. Like the International Bigfoot Symposium. Conference. Conference. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're talking Bigfoot. And we got Markham here with us now. How, how's Atlanta treating you, Markham? Oh, it's all right. Just all right? I hated that place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about uh, about an hour, 20 minutes south of Atlanta. But anywhere I go, like if I go home to Winston-Salem or I go to my real home in Burnsville, i got to go through Atlanta either way. So it's like the 800 pound gorilla sitting in the middle of the room. It's there. <laughs> I got to deal with it. Atlanta's where like, probably some of the craziest shit that I dealt with in the army. Because having a, oh, I don't I, doubt it. I had a security clearance and I worked in a highly classified building with Third Army. And I was heavily into UFO alien research. Those two topics. Um, with a security clearance, they don't they don't smile on you too much. <laughs> so uh, of course, uh, you know I had the clicks on the phone, I had the, the the phone taps going, I had cars follow me and and whatnot. And that was my first reptilian experience. Met another guy that uh, claimed he was an alien. Um, he was interesting to say the least. <coughs> That's what I was with Mufon. So yeah, interesting times. So, Markham, right here in Concrete is where you heard your very first Bigfoot knocks. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah. That we were we were headed up. You, me, I think the kids were with us. We were heading up to uh, just do... We were going to go to that... If I remember right, we were heading to that site where you had the, the encounter with the whooshing noise. We are going to go to that and take some readings. And... Off to the the left of us. I'm not sure what direction that compass direction that is, but it was in the <laughs> deep woods up Haystack, Haystack Mountain. We heard this, uh, and it, it wasn't like never finding Bigfoot where they hammer on a tree. This had a structure to it. Uh-huh. It had a rhythm. It had a a descending. <sighs> It was pattern. a boom, 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 boom. Like, <laughs> yeah, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, the, and as it, you know, it, it wasn't, and it wasn't an echo fading. It was individual knocks, and there was, like I said, there was some structure to it. It wasn't just some moron hammering at a tree with a stick, like you see on the Discovery Channel type stuff. Right. Yeah, you know what kills me is the one the the skeptics that go, oh, it, it's probably a woodpecker. <laughs> I've lived in the, the mountains for years. Fu- I think I know what the hell a woodpecker <laughs> sounds like. Right. Anybody in the yeah. Pacific Northwest hey. has heard a woodpecker. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If that was a Could woodpecker, be a woodpecker. Uh, I'd be more afraid to be that loud as a woodpecker. I'd be more scared of it. <laughs> well, all the animals that came from Japan dumping all that radiation from the Fukushima thingy, friggin', it could be a mutated woodpecker. No, it was Mothman. Five hundred pound woodpecker. <laughs> it was Mothman. Thunderbirds. Yeah. <laughs> we need to do a series on Thunderbirds. Oh, those uh, things are awesome. Okay. I can talk about the '68 Thunderbird for hours. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, let's not do that. He, he, he oh. There'd be so many car jokes. <laughs> so, Fran. Oh, what, God, yeah. <laughs> what do you think Bigfoot is? Francie, you still with us? What? Harry, Harry huh? What? Wake up. <laughs> what, 
So what, what, what do you think Bigfoot is? I think it's interdimensional. That's my personal opinion. And what makes you think interdimensional? Because of the way that, well, we haven't found any bodies or they disappear. I don't know. I think they're. I. I think they pop in and out. Okay, so taking it a step further, you've got the experiencers that talk about seeing Bigfoot coming out of landed spacecraft. You've got the other experiencers that that witness Bigfoot running away from UFOs. What what's your thoughts? Do you do you think there's a connection between Bigfoot and aliens? Maybe. And it could be like screen memory stuff too. Hmm. I've actually never put those two together before. I've, yeah, I've never thought about the screen memory side. The screen memory, yeah. But that's what say, I'm here for. Get... <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, I've never had an abductee describe Bigfoot in their dreams, in their dreamscape, or in their yeah. abduction encounter. Yeah. That part's never been put together. To my knowledge. What we're planning on proving this summer is we're going up on Cumberland where there are UFO sightings and Bigfoot activity and seeing if we can find a tie. And that's where Markham's going to come in with the science side of it. But the thought of it is that he's security for them, right? Eh. So when you go on vacation, do you talk about the concierge? <laughs> like, <laughs> No. So with most of the abductions, the security is the reptilians. They do talk about that. Uh, okay, just, mm -hmm. just going to take this one step further here because I just thought because, about this. Because that's what okay. we do. Exactly. <laughs> so we talked about the alien hybrid program mm -hmm. earlier. Well, do you think that the original Bigfoot was one of the original alien hybrids? And That's the one that's they put in the dude. how it ended up coming out. Hmm. Like it could be a pre... Right, like, they like got one the of the first hominids. Yeah, exactly. Okay, to be one, one of the first hominids that were uh -huh. had its DNA that. twisted and its uh, maybe its mental <laughs> abilities enhanced. Let's right. take let's take that a step further than that. What if Bigfoot was the first alien creation of human? And then we, oh, and then we degressed before we pregressed again. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at the degression before pre-degression, uh, <laughs> you got to go all the way back and you look at the Sphinx and different stuff like that. Uh, it is a possibility. I mean, as a race, we do seem to come to a head and then die out and then come to a head and die out. I mean, looking at ancient Greece and all of these big empires. I was just listening to a, a, a show a couple days ago where the, uh, actually, oh God, it was Alex Jones. Um, <laughs> oh no. Shame on you. Yeah, why, I know, why? right? It was Alex Jones live and he was talking about what if Atlantis is real and the, the coronavirus. Oh Jesus. Was yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm digressing here. Okay. But what if the coronavirus was humans playing with something they weren't ready to play with, and we're about to destroy ourselves like they did Atlantis because we're back to the Atlantis phase where he, the human human race is about to destroy itself because they got toys they shouldn't be playing with. What's your thoughts on that? I don't know. What do you think scientifically, Marco? Well, I think we know we know what the coronavirus is. It's very well studied and mapped, despite what some of the fear mongering on the <laughs> news has been. I would be more concerned. I mean, we've got a history with coronavirus, and usually, if a vi 
it's a virus you shouldn't kill its host. We only run into that when we are first subjected to a virus because it does the virus no service to kill its host because then it quits spreading. Right. Now, when you have long association with, okay, like take rhinovirus, the common cold, Mm -hmm. the kids bring a cold from home, everybody gets the cold, and just about time you're over it, it's gotten antigenically mixed and they bring a new version of it and everybody starts, you know, it's like a cycle through cold season. You know, that's a successful virus. And then they move because it's you. spreading and it's and not mutate. killing the host. Coronavirus, so, we have had some, we've <laughs> had exposure to. I'm more afraid of us coming up with something like when the Arctic or, you know, the tundra thaws coming up with something that we haven't had any exposure to. Yeah. I'm That's going to be more of a, a pandemic killer than something we already know about. I'm ready for the zombie apocalypse. I'm, I'm just not. saying, who goes to, uh, like, who grabs a little cute bat and says, fuck, you look good in a soup. Oh, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 it's not the bat. It's the bat that passed it to the, like, anteater type thing. I can't remember what it's called. And then humans consume the anteater type thing. Oh, what pangolins? The pangolins, there we go. Well... The fact is, when you eat stuff that's not meant to be eaten, you're taking that chance. Yeah, you get sick. You know, this crap, eating anything that's got legs and fur is a bit ridiculous. I don't know. I mean, I guess when you've got, I think when you've got that much of a population, they're going to eat something, so. Well, and that's what I said. Look at the people that eat horse meat. Look at what that does to a human being. Like... It, there are specific creatures that are not meant for consumption, so stop eating them. Yeah, horses. <laughs> no more eating humans. Cats, either. cats, <laughs> pangolins, <Right>. civets. <laughs> Give yourself the human being shakes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Francie. So <laughs> what? How do you differentiate between the paranormal attention seeker? We've encountered them. Oh, and yeah. one who is really having issues. So how do you tell the difference? Yeah. And Mark, you can join. You can jump in any time too. Research. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have to. Yeah, talk we've had our experience enough. with both. Uh, yeah. You, you can... have to talk to them long enough to find out what their motivation is and you look for signs of personality disorder so well well, don't you find that the people that are legitimately having an issue you sometimes it it seems like you almost have to pull their story out of them and the Mm -hmm. attention seeker is a it's like trying to sip off a fire hose they're going to you know, blathers, kind of like the drug seekers in a emergency room. They're going to hit you with so many symptoms and so many. They're just going to have this litany of things that they're going to belch out to get, you know, get what they want. Well, anybody yeah. who tells a lie can get caught in it because they get sidetracked and you can't keep things straight. I think we should tase them, then ask them. <laughs> that's that's a scientific work. point of view, right, Markham? I'm sorry if they're in South yeah. Africa. It's kind of hard to tase them. Oh. It's for science. Oh, it's for science. Okay. <laughs> the pro B becomes the pro bird. <laughs> okay. I, you know, a red flag for me always was too is you would find the attention seeker throughout their their story in about 20 different groups. Not only that, but it's embellished. And that, that's what I'm saying is that when a person is being genuine about something, it typically stays to the same fact, same line. Yeah. When a person is making yeah. something up, it, it starts out the same facts and same line, but then they go, oh, and then this happened, or and then they add this or that because of the fact that it, oh, I that's going to make that a better story. on the team with certain chats that we had, um, 
with a few of the cases that ended up being just not Epic. stuff. <laughs> um, what Eric constantly referred to as this is a fancy case. Um, <laughs> they, uh, if they told their story and then you said, okay, we dealt with that before, they would eat. You didn't even have to tell them what you'd already dealt with. They would come back with, well, but there's more. (laughs) Yes, Mm -hmm. but. Yes, but. Yes, Yes, but. but. Mm -hmm. Just like a drug seeker in the emergency room. Yes, but also, you know, one of the the people in the... (laughs) I I think one of the people that I believe as far as, because his story hasn't changed in 20 years, would be like Catwell more than that. Calvin <laughs> Parker, his story has pretty much stayed the same. And David Adair. I can remember David Adair's oh. interview 20 years ago with Art Bell. Yeah. And, you know, 20 years later with the, the douche. And it was the same story, almost word for word. Well, you know, when you, you know, actually... Very little... Uh, when, when you actually <laughs> live through something... It doesn't change. Your story can't change. It, right. It, you lived through it. This is exactly what happened. Right. I got. I got. And then change. the other thing it, what, that uh, that I remember is when people, you know, you you get them focused on on trying things, and they won't do it. Yes, but I can't do that. I, you know. And they don't follow excuses. through, and they make excuses. Yeah. I got to jump topics real quick. As Trip is in the chat room, and I want to hear your answer, uh, Marco. So, what's your thoughts on the bodies that are dug up with black plague and such? Can we still catch diseases from ancient graves? Yes, D- depend. Yeah, in some cases, they have found the bodies they dug up that were part of the Franklin expedition up in Alaska, or maybe it was beyond Alaska, but anyhow, they found these, uh, they found these three bodies, and they dug them up, and they found a uh, Spanish flu virus in some of them. Uh, and you're still Yeah, viable? I think, yes. Yes, that, now, I'm not that sure was if that was the, the Franklin. The Yukon that, one, that might not have been the Franklin. Yeah, I'm, I'm confusing two different... The Franklin Expedition bodies were something else. They did find something, but they, but they actually went to a a graveyard that they knew of that had some uh, 1918 Spanish flu epidemic uh, bodies in it, and they found viable Spanish flu virus in the oh, tissues wonderful. of those bodies. Well, you well, know, you're looking at with a virus, you're looking at something that barely. Matter of fact, it's. We're not even sure as sci- in, sci- in biology whether to assign this as a living. It's almost, I mean, it's like at the very bare minimum of what is considered living. There's, It's more of a mechanism. So mm-hmm. it's not really, if you have it in the right, if you have it in a tissue and it's preserved in the permafrost, it can stay viable because there's really, there's not that much life, so to speak. You know, them and prions are just like so primitive. Like I said, they operate more like machines than they do biological entities. Well, look at how long, like the TB virus, for instance. The TB can live forever. I mean... Years. Oh, it's originally. Yeah, that's a big, that's a real big uh, issue in my profession. Mm-hmm. Usually, if you do any kind of work with, uh, if you do any kind of work with TB, it's a special room. It, You've exactly, got a special hood, yeah, it, it, isolation hood, uh-huh. a special kind of eight hundred dollar a tube fluorescent uh, UV yeah, light to sterilize. Like you the know, old you nuke hospital, the place they still find leave. traces of it, you know? And, I mean, some of them have been closed since the early 1900s, and they still find traces of TV in them. 
What well, wasn't that the original uh, mummy's curse when they went into the tombs? What are they saying? Uh, originally, some of the viruses and the uh, bacteria that was in the tombs when they opened up some of the chambers was caused by. I think. I think some of that was uh, more of a mold spore, mm-hmm. because mold spores are ubiquitous. And if you get, you know, there's a European being exposed to an old, an old world, you know, a, you know, African virus or African mold that it's immune system. It's sort of like when the Spanish explorers brought syphilis, gonorrhea, and smallpox. To the Americas, they left a black swath <laughs> along their travels because the Indians didn't have any kind of resistance to it. So yeah, you're getting, you know, sort of like old world payback. <laughs> I think. And, and but I think a lot of it was uh, malaria and the, the King Tut's curse thing. If you really, really study it, what you find is a lot of that was newspaper you know it, it sold papers so they took a little bit of fact and added a lot of supposition and legend to it to sell papers and come up with king tut's curse but yeah if you're in a, a strange environment like that you know people should be wearing respirators right of course that wasn't chic back then so or even thought of back then yeah, and tri- Trip saying it's not what he wanted to hear because uh, they're digging up plague bodies in Europe. Well, I don't. Bubonic plague is a different organism. That's uh, uh, oh, I mean, I'm trying not to Google it. Uh, <laughs> you uh, oh crap! I can't think of the name of the organism, but it's not. I don't think it's it's a bacteria, and I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's going to be viable that long. Oh, God, what is that crap called? <laughs> uh, or, no, that's whooping cough. Crap. <laughs> chlamydia. Oh, it'll come to me because prairie dogs <laughs> carry it too. Oh, they carry chlamydia too. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh. Never heard them walking across the ground just clapping. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> so, what about the elk wasting disease? That that's a prion, isn't it? It might be. Those the science. Very little. I mean, prions were considered new, new organisms, new, new pathogens in my micro books. Twenty, oh god, almost thirty years ago, I guess, when I was in ninety two, ninety three, when I took bacteriology. Prions were just starting to be. They were at the back of the book after viruses. It's like, oh, by the way, there's these single-stranded self-replicating proteins mm. called prions. Yeah, that's right. They're, you know, like Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, and uh, so, we had you know, when I was working on this one of the psych units, we had a patient that came in, and we thought he was catatonic. That that was his original diagnosis, and within about 24 hours and he came in ER to psych and then within 24 hours he was on the medical floor in the ICU because they figured out it was uh, I don't know how you say it Creutzfeldt Jakob disease Creutzfeldt Jakob CJ yeah CJD and he well, was gone in three days he was yeah. lucky because we had a we had a outbreak of that in the mountains of Spruce Pine, and that guy lingered for months and Whoa. months and so months. Trips saying, yeah, uh, they TB caught clinics, it. Uh, that are abandoned or used in the past still carry TB, and I can actually answer that one because the Fircrest Hospital 
in Shoreline. Shoreline. Um, Kayla's mom used to work there, and there is a wing of that hospital that is completely abandoned. They're not allowed to use it, and they're not allowed to destroy it. Oh because my gosh! Because, because it was the TB wing. Yeah. And that was 20 years ago, at least, that it shut down. Yeah. And they're still not allowed to touch it. So, the, yeah, like that, that, that disease does carry for quite a long time. It can sit dormant, and you can still get it off the items in that wing. Yeah, the acid fast, all the acids fast bacilli are kind of tricky in that they're well protected. <coughs> I'm not sure how long that stuff can stay dormant. I know that we didn't take chances with it at the reference lab. Everything was sealed. It was carried in. The You wore a mask. You wore a gown. Uh, you UV'd the place. You know, you put the UV lamps on, sterilized the place where you walked in. You did your job. You put the UV lights on under the hood. And you put the UV lights on in the entire that little the TB lab because UV will kill will kill it. UV kills just about all that stuff, but it's a specific wavelength in there. I think those lights were about. They said that somebody was screwing around, broke one with a broom handle, and it was like eight hundred dollar light bulb Yikes. or light yeah. tube. But anyway, there's a specific thing, and you leave. You know, we just left it on till the next day. Or, you know, several hours would go by of saturating that space with UV light. But, yeah, you don't screw around with that. You're no. semi a pestis. And I, I think it That's, also has to do with it the... It just popped into my head. What the building is made out of pestis. doesn't help. Because well, it's like cheap concrete that they used to use. Right. Yeah. You know, and that, like, those porous rocks damp. will just hold anything. And, uh, yeah, with all the dampness here, that wouldn't help either. And, you know, Nikki brings up a good point in, in the chat, too. You know, that, you, you could chalk that up as another paranormal danger. Because how many of these paranormal investigator teams do you know go exploring old hospitals? And old oh, my gosh. Units? And no, they can't. The that T like the T B wings at of any hospital that I know are completely shut down. No one is allowed in there. I would think. But her question is But you know what's be, funny? Huh. Out out in Kentucky, the Mammoth Caves they used to use they used to think that the cave environment was good for T B. And there were T B wards and the the cave tour takes you into this one huge space that used to be operated as a TB ward. That ain't smart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you were talking about viruses, and you said that most viruses don't kill their hosts, right? Well, it, a successful virus doesn't. Okay, but Because if a... You know, think about, about it, because if a virus kills its host, its normal host. Okay, that's why things like... Uh, Patient zero. Oh, Marburg or, well, things like Marburg virus and, uh, oh, the one they did the movie Outbreak about, uh, uh, Ebola, things like that. They exist in reservoir species successfully. They don't kill their reservoir species. Mm -hmm. It's when you encroach in, you know, and Ebola didn't used to break out until we started destroying you know, forests, and people started eating bush meat, which is, like, you know, anything that can't get away from you, <laughs> basically. And so what happens is that virus came out of its normal host into this new host. But we have no, you know, we have no defense against Ebola or Marburg. We just liquefy. Right. But Nikki's question, though, is can people gear up to go investigate those wings. So, well, unless you're in a level one uh, decontamination scene at a minimum, 
Um, I wouldn't even want to take that risk. And then the equipment's <laughs> kind of useless for a while afterwards. Right? Well, you can use a papper. I mean, I have to be, because of my beard and mustache, I can't. If right. you are clean shaven and know what you're doing, you can protect yourself against TB with a simple paper and N95 mask. If you have facial hair like me, you have to use a thing called a papper, which is basically the kind of like what you're talking about, where you have the whole head piece that right. fits around, seals, seals around your neck, and has a fan on it. Oh, right. With so a the filter same gear system. that you have to use when you do the asbestos removals. Yeah, because TB yeah. is a respiratory illness. Pretty much. Yeah. A, it's... Yeah, spread through respiratory droplets. Right. But when you're talking viruses and uh, uh, other <laughs> forms of bacteria, uh, you, you know, I, I, it's really risky going into some of these old buildings. Mm-hmm. You don't know what was there. You don't. Want, you don't know what they used. Well, to. in the old buildings, the mold is the mold spores. Oh yeah, and you the, get that black you know, the mold. mold spores, you're going to get a lot more problems with things like fumigatus or you know there's there's molds that just love the moist and you know conditions of the human lung <laughs> legionella a large percentage of the kentucky population has histoplasmosis of kentucky yeah that's a like bird born that's, that's, yeah that's carried in bird droppings Histoplasmosis. So I've got a, uh, a an off the wall question here. Missing four one one. Do you think it's harder on family and friends knowing someone is missing with no explanation, as in a paranormal explanation, versus a rational one? Hmm. I would. Say no. Well, How are they going to know? I don't, though? I don't know. Psychologically, I think it's really hard when there is missing information, like missing yeah. pieces. Because what happens with, like, I used to do work with firefighters and, and police officers after bad calls, bad incidents. And what you wanted to do is get them talking to each other so that they could fill in the blanks for one another about <laughs> who did what and what happened and, oh, I didn't know that you had the, you know, that you flipped the switch and, you know, all of that. And it kind of, like, helps put away the memory um, so that it it's, it kind of lays it to rest. And when there's missing parts, it's you never get the chance to, to do that. I would think the closure would be harder, knowing that there is no explanation of why your loved one or friend is missing, versus, mm-hmm. okay, a serial, serial killer found him, or uh, killed him, body's been found, there's closure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, I think we want answers. We like to have that end point. We like yeah. to have that period at the end of the sentence, you know. I think that would Uncle also Charlie on died because blank, you know. So do I. Mm-hmm. No, I, I really do. I think that would also the depend been on found, the person. They did it the wrong way. I'm just saying. Because there's some people that don't want that closure. There's some people that want to believe that somewhere out there that person is still living. They're still going but, on. But so looking. Well, look yeah, at the, but look they're at the in pattern. denial. I mean, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, think the, I think the I think the question Eric was answer was asking though is among those who are rational and not in the denial. I don't know. Would if you rather have denial, though, Uncle George died of a gunshot wound, or did Uncle George? What happened to Uncle George? Was he possibly abducted? Was he eaten by big? You know, you you want a a, lot of a rational folk, answer. A lot of the missing four one ones are kids too right mm-hmm. both yeah both. so but like you think of how many kids are actually being found years later now there was a huge string of kids that went missing in the 90s that are now being found really 
if you watch the news, yeah, like about every three months they find another kid. Oh my and gosh! It's, <clears throat> they just wander out. Yeah, there was that whole series of kids that were. But the thing, okay, so with missing four hundred one, a lot of these kids that are actually found alive have missing time in their mind. Exactly. Yes, Some of these yes, kids don't do. know anywhere where they've been. No. No. They That's the parable side of it. 15, 20 years later and that much older. But, but that could be trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't that be could. trauma as absolutely. much as anything is they don't absolutely. want to remember? But that's if you were I'm some saying. perverted asshole sex slave for your, all your <laughs> life and you finally get away, maybe you don't want to remember that. But having that hope two years later that your significant friend, like your significant family member, is still alive, that that might not be denial all the time. I think everybody hopes. I mean, it's just human nature to hope that something, oh, circumstances made it so that they're still alive somewhere, that this is going to happen or whatever. I I think that that's what gets a lot of people through those dark times. There's a few people out there that that's go true. missing, and I just say, "Hey, <laughs> good on you." <ya." laughs> uh, okay, we're okay, we're coming down to the last twenty minutes. Uh, so, Francie, have you ever caught any ridicule being a therapist? that's actually interested in the paranormal. No, because I started doing it after I retired. <laughs> <laughs> It, it it's gonna it, it's really hard to maintain your profession and be interested in this still. And the 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 psychiatrists that have written books about recently they take a lot of flack. And you know what, I think for both you and Markham, that would happen. Like, I know you wouldn't see it as much now that you're retired, but there's still got to be colleagues that um, got to give you like weird, like past colleagues that give you weird looks when you say, hey, I'm going on a paranormal show tonight. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, and, and, but if you're still working, you're in the money stream and you're competing for dollars in one way or another, research dollars or, you know, whatever. And it, it puts you at a disadvantage, I think. Well, do you Marco, do you find that? Yeah, I'm about to say, Mark, have you ever, have you ever caught shit for being a scientist in the paranormal? Um, not really. I mean, I proudly use my <laughs> Forest Moon Paranormal Coffee Cup at work, and <laughs> right. people know that I, and people know, yeah, it's at the lab right now, uh, people know that I own, you know, a radio network, and that it's paranormal, so, uh, I, you know, I don't get any, like, overt crap about it, in fact, uh, I've had a few people back in Winston-Salem, where I used to live, you know, it's like, Hey, let's get a group together. Right. It's amazing how when you just get people relaxed to talk, you know, like ER docs and mm -hmm. ER nurses, you get stories about, you know, the, the stories start to come out. Of course, now if you say, hey, can I quote you on that? Oh, no, I didn't tell you that for public consumption. You know, they just, they get all defensive, so I've learned not to even bring that up. Just mm -hmm. to collect the stories in my mind, I may write a book about it someday. But mm -hmm. you know, it's it, it's very easy in our field to have that that experience. I mean, I've had footsteps following me down a hall at a, at a new facility. I mean, that facility wasn't five years old when that happened, and it wasn't an echo. <laughs> you know, because as soon as I stopped. You know, I stopped walking. I could still hear the footsteps coming. But looking behind at the, me, looking at the fact that it's a medical facility where death happens probably on an almost daily basis, I wouldn't be surprised by that. Oh. You know, that one was. I think. 
I think that the what made that one more active is that this was the kind of place you came to get a ba- you know it was basically a band aid station. It wasn't the kind of place you'd bring a trauma. So I mean, for the early. yeah, it was. So I think in this case, there were so few spirits that when that one or two a year that might, you know, might have come in and died, had that freak heart attack, or they came from a a nursing home and they passed. I don't think there was enough of a like. I kind of get the impression the place I'm at now has a population of indwelling spirits that know that they're dead. Right. And if you re- if you pass in this place, I'm sure you you look around and there's you catch on pretty quick that hey <laughs> something's wrong here. I think I'm dead. Where that little place that I had just like I said it was only a few years old. There hadn't been that many people die there we had no inpatients it was strictly an emergency room Mm -hmm. at that time you might get somebody that's they haven't caught on yet you know there's not Mm -hmm. this resident population of you know spirits wandering around it's like yeah i get the impression from the one i encountered it's like why aren't you helping me Nobody's listening to me. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, it was like they didn't know they were dead and couldn't understand why the nursing staff and the doctors were ignoring them. Yeah. I worked in a hospital with a haunted elevator on a psych unit once. Her name was Nurse Chase, and she was decapitated by the elevator doors. They kind of like took her head off. Mm -hmm. Mm. And she would follow... Oh, it was was very strange. She would follow people down the hall. She was still working. Mm -hmm. She was there still working and she moved stuff and followed people around on their rounds and usually at night but in the daytime too yeah I don't think that that whole thing about going out at night if the place is haunted it's as haunted in the day as it is at the night you just notice it, it hospitals in the daytime are crazy bustling busy. yes yes at night it's a little quieter the patients for the most part they're they're <clears throat> either asleep on their own or heavily medicated and yeah you're right there's uh like navy ships i think most of the navy ships had either some kind of they either had some kind of uh superstition the nimitz had a superstition that actually happened and i think it was the enterprise was supposedly haunted by a guy who got electrocuted switching over from shore power to the ship's 4,160 volt bus site. He threw the switch and it arced through him and supposedly melted his feet to the floor, that kind of thing. I don't, now that was a, you know, the difference between a fairy tale and a sea story is one begins once upon a time and the other one <laughs> hey this is no crap <laughs> right. but you know there are, there are persistent and you think I would think that a I think the combination you get a ship like the uh, North Carolina battleship that saw saw a lot of death and you have this thing in the water in a tide and I think the, the salt water flowing back and forth across mm. that hull creates a power source. Right. And I think between the trauma, the history, and, you know, people get attached to their ships. I mean, oh, yeah. there's... A, my dad, my dad <laughs> literally cried when he saw the USS Picking got sunk... You know, at the end of service, 
She'd been another Navy, came back, and they sank her like an artificial reef. I could see him haunting that ship. Oh, hands down. If it was, if it was, if it was in a, if it was in like a mothball fleet or if it was still afloat, and you can, I can see that people, you know, sailors would stay on board their ship if they they had an attachment to it. So you get something like the Carolina USS North Carolina that had an esprit de, you know, it has an esprit de corps to it, or um, that ship I lived on while the Nimitz was in dry dock. The Darby. It was the USNS Darby. Now, the, the story behind it was during Vietnam, it took, it was a refrigerated ship, so it would take fresh supplies over, and then it would bring bodies back in the refrigerators. And there was all kind of crazy crap that happened on that ship. I mean, that was probably my first experience in ghost busting, was exploring you know, the holes getting down in the, the bottom of that ship. But, you know, there's guys, it's like, okay, one minute they're in the sunshine in North Vietnam or in Vietnam, and next thing they're in this dark steel coffin refrigerator box. Yo, know, what happens? Well, you know, what happened? I think there was a lot of spirits that were stuck on that. It's the same with uh, you know soldiers uh, on the ground. Uh, they get uh, when when they, if they get killed, they get stuck to their uniform. You, they'll put that uniform in a, in a museum, and then they wonder why the museum's haunted because you know objects can attract spirits. Whether it's their personal well, uniform. Well, look at Gettysburg. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know they they see ghosts <laughs> in uniform at Gettysburg all the time. Right. You know these guys have been fighting the Civil War. For over a hundred years. All right, we're we're down to our last ten minutes. So, Francie, if any of our listeners have any any psychiatric uh, paranormal oriented questions, where they, where can they find you? Can they find you on Facebook? I'm on Facebook. <laughs> just look for excellent. <laughs> <laughs> just look for Francie Bullock Miller, and uh, yep. send her a friend request, and you can ask her questions. Uh, and Markham, where can we find KTLK The Fringe? Oh, job. Uh, you your own got our website. No, actually, uh, I don't. Uh, it's kind of. You to do a show. You know, I'm living in a motel room <laughs> right now, and I'd like to. I got a hold of some of my old music people, and I'm trying to figure out a way to tie independent music to the paranormal and make a show out of it. I think that would be fun. But uh, got... right now, I just, you know, dad died in December, and oh. I didn't know, we didn't know how far advanced he was, because we were getting two stories. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one doctor was completely wrong, and it turned out, get this, the VA was right. So I signed an extension. So basically, I'm living down here in a roadway, and it's a little hard to do a quality show from, you know, where I'm at right now. The end of April, I'm going to revisit, you know, when this contract's up, I'm going to revisit whether I want to stay on the road or if I want to go into semi-retirement, maybe I'll do my show then. Because I'll have a stable, you know, everyday studio. And you'll be coming up this way. (laughs) Thank you very much, Francie, for... um, answering all of our questions. Oh, it's been much fun. And a very happy birthday to you. Thank you. Um, just a reminder to all our listeners, um, Oregon Ghost Con is coming up March 27th through 29th. Um, tickets go on sale Monday. Go to OregonGhostConvention.com and get your tickets before they run out. Um and make sure you stop by the S4 booth while you're there. Absolutely. We will be there with bells on and tons of merchandise. We'll have our I am our not mugs, wearing bells. Bumper stickers. You're not wearing bells? <laughs> I will not wear bells. got to wear bells. I also got to say we will be at the Skagit County Fair August 12th to the 15th. Yep. And the Bigfoot, Internet. International Bigfoot Conference. Conference, September 4th to the 6th in Kennewick. 
Yeah, and also for any of our local listeners who are listening tonight or listening in the next 24 hours, um, make sure you are at Town Hall at 6 p.m. tomorrow night for the... Town Conference. Town Conference. And they're talking about the uh, emergency shelter that's being proposed. Yeah, come support it, so... Or I'm coming after you. No. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So... Thanks for listening. Next week we have the Military Paranormal uh, Group. The Military Veterans Paranormal. There you go. Coming on the show (laughs) next week. And we will be talking about uh, does military training help you as a paranormal investigator? And everything they've been doing. So anyway, you'll have one part of your training that doesn't help. Huh? What? You can't shoot a ghost. I'm sorry. <laughs> With rock salt in a shotgun. <laughs> I haven't tried it. They make well, salt guns now. <laughs> anyway, I would works. think, yeah. What? I would think it would. I do, too. Because we use salt right. for Because you have a discipline, attention to detail, discipline. Uh, I thought you were talking about the shotgun. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I don't know about the... <clears throat> I, I, I'd say people who are currently in the military, but... I know quite a few gentlemen, but ones that's probably sitting about two feet away from me that the discipline thing kind of went out the window. <laughs> hey, dude, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't get up at six now, in the morning to go running anymore. Hell no. Anyway, y'all have a I safe week this my week. My profession keeps me honed yet. <laughs> yeah, I need to do more push-ups. That's what it is. Anyway. <laughs> y'all have a safe week. And remember... Keep your eyes to the skies. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight on S4, the official voice of Forest Moon Paranormal. You can contact S4 through our website at www.s-4radio.com or on Facebook. Make sure you give us a like on our page and join the Forest Moon Paranormal group. If you are interested in advertising, take a look at our packages and contact Cole or Eric at 1-360-999-2830. Again, thank you. And remember, keep your eyes to the sky.